Hello, all you wonderful people. So as you might know, I am partaking in the 100 Movies I've Missed Challenge in 2021. Last year, I saw this challenge on Letterboxd and a couple of my friends who have done it before. My last video about this challenge, I did the first 16 movies that I had seen at the time on my list. I haven't been doing the best with keeping up with my movies, but I figured we should just do the recap now to have a smaller number of movies to talk about today, and then I will hopefully be catching back up to complete this challenge this summer. The 17th movie on my Movies I've Missed list was The Danish Girl. So The Danish Girl stars Alicia Vikander and Eddie Redmayne as Eddie Redmayne plays one of the first people to ever undergo a sex reassignment surgery and it's a very tragic movie it's a very beautiful movie the whole thing feels like it's a painting which is very fitting because the two characters in the film lily and Gerda, i believe are their names are artists the movie is just a very heartbreaking look at what it means to search for identity both for lily to search for her identity as a woman and for gerda to search for her identity when she loses her husband it's a very very emotional movie and i will say it's a little slower if you're looking for a happy-go-lucky movie this maybe isn't what you should pick for movie night number 18 on my list was her which i have always wanted to see and honestly, I think it's my favorite Joaquin Phoenix performance. Obviously, his role in Joker is iconic, and I just watched Gladiator, which we'll get to in a little bit, and he plays the role of Cranky Caesar very well, but in her... I think it is a beautiful example and look at what it means to be in a relationship and what your responsibility as a partner is in a relationship. So Joaquin Phoenix's character, Theo, is in a relationship with Samantha, who is an AI played by Scarlett Johansson. And I mean, I can't blame the man who wouldn't fall in love with Scarlett Johansson, you know what I mean? I think this movie is a really interesting exploration of what people actually do connect over in relationships and how you make those kind of things work. It also is a very interesting look at gender and the gender roles that are abided to or ignored in relationship. This movie also explores what it means to be intimate with another person because in this movie, he cannot literally be intimate with Samantha if you know what I'm saying. Also, this movie has a fantastic performance by Amy Adams and it kills me to see her in this movie or American Hustle and know that that woman doesn't have an Oscar. Academy, get your stuff together, please and thank you sincerely all of us. Then I watched a follow-up film, which these two actually really go together, which is Lost in Translation, which if you don't know, Lost in Translation is from director Sofia Ford Coppola and her is from Spike Jones. And the two were at one point married and did divorce. And a lot of people believe that these two movies kind of are in conversation with one another as both are exploring the damage of a broken human relationship um and then what these people on each side what they go on to do in the future i think honestly lost in translation even though it's an older film i may have preferred it more lost in translation was far more emotional where her was a little bit clearer with what it was trying to say. But I do think these make for a great double feature night. Um, not that I want to pry into personal people's personal lives, but I do think it's really interesting to look at pieces of art and films as having something to say and being in conversation with one another. I think that's the best thing that films can do. What I loved about Lost in Translation was I had never really had an appreciation for Bill Murray as anything other than a comedic actor before. I've seen him in Stripes, I've seen him in Ghostbusters, but I'd never seen him in a role where I think he's kind of more of a out of place guy and it's not played for laughs sort of situation. And I really just like the exploration of this. Also Scarlett Johansson, again, she's the other thing connecting these two movies. 19 when she filmed this when i was 19 i was having a breakdown over the fact that lady gaga released poker face when she was 21 which i'm now 21 and i've never had the success of either of these women so this like they're incredible scarlett johansson is amazing can't wait for her in black widow then i watched american hustle so back to amy adams this movie shocked me at how much i loved it i mean i do i shouldn't be that surprised because one this movie is jammed packed with actors Jeremy Renner, Jennifer Lawrence, Amy Adams, Bradley Cooper, Christian Bale. It's fantastic. And I am a huge fan of fraud, maybe is the wrong word, but like heist movies. And this is that, but downplayed a little bit. And I love it. All the different roles in this film, the way it's shot, it takes place in the 70s and is based supposedly on some real life events. 
And the only thing that I think is funny is that Jennifer Lawrence is the wife of Christian Bale and Amy Adams is his mistress. But I feel like those would be swapped if it was in actuality. Not that I don't think Amy Adams is beautiful, but you know, Jennifer Lawrence is J-Law. After American Hustle, I watched My Friend Dahmer, which is a movie I've wanted to see since I heard that Ross Lynch was going to be playing Jeffrey Dahmer in this film. It explores Jeffrey Dahmer's life in high school. So if you are a little uncomfortable with serial killers and true crime, don't worry, this movie doesn't have anything to do with any of his actual crimes or murders. It is actually based on a graphic novel by one of Dahmer's friends in high school who released this. It's been a little contentious as to whether the events of the graphic novel and in the movie are factual or not. In this film, Dahmer is made to do all these pranks because he does them kind of on his own and then he kind of gets a group of buddies who are like super supportive of that behavior. But then when it comes time for them all to graduate and go off to college, they all kind of decide he's weird and they don't like it anymore. And he's kind of been made to and socialized to believe that this behavior is okay. And then as soon as they decide to drop him, he has no support structure. I think it's super sad that he had such a messed up home life and that his little brother was really prioritized over him. However, that does not excuse his crimes. And I think this is just a really interesting character study of someone who would later become a monster. Next, a movie I had really been dying to see, which maybe would make a good double feature with American Hustle, is Ocean's Eleven. Now, I've seen Ocean's Eight probably three or four times. I love that movie. And so I was like, I have to see Ocean's Eleven. And I did not even know at the time that it was Steven Soderbergh who directed Ocean's Eleven. I love Logan Lucky. I watched it for the first time last year. So it was only fitting that I watched Ocean's Eleven now. And wow, is that movie great. The only thing that's kind of annoying is Don Cheadle's British accent seems to change like every five seconds and i also don't know why he needed the british accent then a movie that it's only fitting that we talk about is venom so i watched the very first venom probably about a month to two months ago and i really fell in love with it tom hardy is incredible in it some of the things i said in my trailer reaction which guys twenty thousand views what things i said in that trailer reaction video that i are worth mentioning again michelle williams wig why she's blonde in real life i'm pretty sure why did they feel the need to put that atrocious wig on her like why how are you doing today jasmine but you did this for what why not why why not <laughs> why though i don't understand okay then i watched midsummer which <laughs> this movie is amazing but terrifying and i still don't know if i fully processed this film but midsummer has florence Pugh. this movie she is incredible in and i totally understand everyone's frustration with the academy's just non-perception of horror in the slightest because lapita nyong'o and florence Pugh gave two of the best performances in a motion picture that i've seen in the last like i don't know five ten years and both of them were completely snubbed by the academy and that is a damn shame. Like when people say it's a horror film in broad daylight, you don't understand it until you watch it. Like the movie is incredibly unsettling and the long takes and the really, really dragged out zoom ins or pull outs are so unsettling. And I think it's such a crash course in how to use film form to make a movie uncomfortable to watch there's a couple scenes where you're gonna have to cover your eyes if you're scared but you see them coming which is the best part for me as a non-horror fan you'll never believe i've never seen this movie before with how much i talk about rom-coms and chick flicks but the devil wears prada i really like the movie but anne hathaway's character is kind of insufferable she's kind of a horrible friend she's kind of a horrible girlfriend in the beginning she definitely doesn't deserve what's coming at her from emily blunt's character who like, whoever said Emily Blunt could look like that? What's so interesting about this movie is the downward arc of Anne Hathaway's character. Because at the beginning of the movie, I'm mad at Anne Hathaway's boyfriend for being upset with her for having this job and, like, trying to take it so seriously. But then by the end of the movie, I'm mad at her for, like, giving up on it all and being like, screw this, I don't need this. Um, sort of situation it feels very petty and naive to me like I understand that this is based on an actual memoir and I understand that this is based on real life experiences and I will say having a crappy boss sucks 
and doing all this sucks but like do you know how many skills she probably could put on her resume after this and how any job she wanted she'd get after this because she was miranda Priestley's assistant also the office scene where michael watches the devil wears prada and he like gets halfway through and he's treating pam badly i have so much more appreciation for that now then I watched Brokeback Mountain, which interestingly came out the year that Crash came out and was nominated at the same Oscars as Crash, which I talked about in my first 100 movies I'd missed. Now, Crash, I had kind of been told going into it that it was kind of not the best movie. But what I find super interesting is how in 2004, 2005, whenever the Oscar ceremony was held, Brokeback Mountain was not taken seriously because it is such a good movie. It is... It's very much like Danish Girl in the sense that it is a very slow moving movie that's very beautiful and that has a kind of sad ending. It takes place over many years where these two men are trying to come to terms with their own sexuality. Anne Hathaway is also in this, which was crazy to see her pop up in this. And Michelle Williams is also in this as Heath Ledger's wife in the film, which is where they met in real life. And most recently, I checked out Gladiator, which... I don't, I think there's a problem with something like the 100 movie challenge. When you're watching movies that have come out during your lifetime that people have hyped up throughout your life and you finally get a chance to sit down and watch them. And sometimes on first viewing, that just doesn't hit you. This happened to me with Inception and is now happening to me with Gladiator. I feel like I've heard that these movies are so amazing for so long that then when I actually watch them, I don't know if they were my cup of tea. Now, Inception, I think it was maybe just that everyone has talked about the ending for so long. Gladiator was almost the same thing. I think the most exciting parts of Gladiator are the first two thirds of the film. And by the last third, I was a little just confused with what was going on and didn't maybe care as much because I felt like the weight of the film had already been going on. By the time that Russell Crowe takes off his helmet in the ring and the Caesar, Joaquin Phoenix's character, recognizes him and admits that he is Maximus and that his family was murdered. I feel like a lot of the punch of the movie has already been struck and is kind of gone. And that was just a little disappointing for me. However, that doesn't mean I didn't like the film. I think it's a fantastic film. Also, I was definitely thrown off by the fact that the music in this movie is essentially the same as Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, please don't think I'm ignorant. I have done research into this. Apparently Hans Zimmer and I don't want to say his understudy, but a partner of his worked on a movie in 1994, 1996 that had a very similar score that was basically pulled out and reused for Gladiator and then that was built upon for Pirates of the Caribbean. Now it's almost like that thing in pop music where if it has a certain tone or like melody that it becomes more popular and sticks in your head and I think all the film scores are great. I just think it definitely threw me off in the moment, trying to figure out where I knew it from and then just singing the parts of the Caribbean score. Those are the last 11 movies that I've seen. So I've seen a total of 27 movies out of the 100 that I'm supposed to watch. So I'm not exactly on schedule, but I'm hoping to catch up in the next few months. Comment down below which of these films is a personal favorite of yours or something I should include on my list. I got a couple of great recommendations on my last video, which I will definitely be adding to the list if they're not already on there. And I would love to get more from you guys just so that my film repertoire can continue to grow thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you in my very next video bye y'all